Glory be to God. All right, let's just dive straight into the word this morning. Father, we want to thank you for the time and the privilege that we have to come before you to open your mysteries and your word. We thank you for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit who is guiding us and who is teaching us and who is helping us. We thank you that our hearts are open and that the implanted seed of your word will have room to grow and to mature and to manifest. And so, Father, we thank you now in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. All right. Amen. So, let's go to Luke chapter 18. Uh, in the message translation, please, uh, begin from verse 18. Luke 18, 18. Uh, we've been talking about how the Father, we know that our life is God-given and therefore must be God-governed. And so, this morning, I just want to uh, focus a little bit more. <clears throat> Last week, we talked about how the fact that if a trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who shall prepare for battle? And so this morning, I just want to focus a little more and just talk about trusting God with your life. Trusting God with your life. Trusting God with your life. Here we go. Luke 18, 18. One day, one of the local officials asked him, good teacher, what must I do? To deserve eternal life. Next verse. Jesus said, why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandments, don't you? No illicit sex. No killing. No stealing. No lying. Honor your father and your mother. He said, I have kept them all for as long as I can remember. That's the first lie this man told. Next verse. When Jesus heard that, he said, then there's only one thing left to do. Sell everything you own and give it away to the poor. You have riches in heaven, then come and follow me. This was the last thing the official expected to hear. Let me just pack that for one minute. Now, for the last several weeks now, we've been talking about how God has a plan for our lives. He has recorded every day of your living in his book. Every moment that you will breathe and be alive for is already recorded in God's book. He knows everything. He's ordained it, ordered it, planned it. The plans that he has for us are plans of peace and not of evil, to bring us an expected end. We understand that if God called us forth, and we know he did that because we were with him before we ever got here. The Bible makes it very clear. He was acutely aware of us before we were ever born. And therefore, he has a plan, and he has a, uh, a program, a purpose for us. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, First uh, Timothy chapter 1 verse 9, all of the scriptures made it very clear. We were created in Christ Jesus before the world was, was found and created unto good works. So we know all of this. And we've talked at length, and we're going to be talking about this a lot more, about how the Holy Spirit's job is to guide me and you from moment to moment to moment to moment until we fulfill God's plan and purpose for our lives. That's why we cannot gainsay or speak enough about you and I having a very close and intimate relationship with Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself made it clear in John 16 verse 12. He said, I have many more things to say to you, but you are not able to bear it. In other words, you don't have the bandwidth to receive what I, what I can tell you about your life. You don't have the capacity at this point to take in the things I have for you. In fact, if I tell you now, you will not believe it. So rather than tell you now, I'll keep it, and in time, I will dispense this information to you through the Holy Spirit. It's our guide, it's our teacher, it's the one that the Bible says will tell us things to come. Now, I'm saying all of that because when you look at all, when you look at all of those messages, and we come to this moment, this verse 23 says, the last thing the official expected to hear was what Jesus just told him. 
Okay, let, let me take a pause there. As you and I are anticipating our new life in Christ and moving into God's purpose and God's plan and going from where we are to that promised land, the last thing we think God wants to say to us is, let's take a look at your giving. Ah, yes. Woo, I saw the blood, blood, blood it just flew right over because, you, you, know, you know what I'm saying to you? Okay, go back to verse 22 again, please. Verse 22. Verse 22. When Jesus heard that, now remember when a man came to Jesus in Luke 18, 18. He came to ask the question about eternal life. Is that correct? No, okay, go to Luke 18, 18 again, please. You guys, I, I don't know if you guys are just asleep or... Luke 18, 18. Let's go back there. One day, one of the local officials asked him, good teacher, what must I do to deserve eternal life? What's eternal life? God's kind of life. Everlasting life. Everlasting life. But beyond and all of that, eternal life is not just something you live when you get to heaven. Eternal life is what's happening to you now. The moment you became born again, you receive eternal life, meaning your life your quality of life has changed. Eternal life has to do the quality of living while you're here. Don't tell me about heaven. How about now? Heaven will take care of himself when you get there. But in the meantime, while you're here, God is expecting the manifestation of his eternal life through you. Right now. Not something in the by and by future to come. So this guy came to Jesus and said, what must I do to get this quality of living? Eternal life, peace, deliverance, prosperity, salvation, joy, uh, just, just uh, uh, favor, and all of the things that has to do with eternal life. God's kind of life. Being on top and not below. Being above and never be beneath. Making progress, never going backwards. Eternal life. So that's the question. Notice Jesus did not send him to seminary. Back to that verse 23, please. Verse 23 again. Haven't given you the context. Verse 23. Okay, verse 22, I'm sorry. Verse 22. When Jesus heard that, he said, there's only one thing left to do. Not two. One. One. Sell everything you own and give it away to the poor. You will have riches in heaven, then come follow me. You know what's so funny? I'm, I'm, I'm speaking, but I'm laughing. When I look at your faces, all of your faces for the most part looks like the man. <laughs> what the Bible says in verse 23. Give me verse 23 again. Look at what it says. <laughs> you guys need to get on it over there, please. Thank you very much. This was the last thing the official expected to hear. And I'm looking at your faces. The last thing you guys expect to hear this morning is exactly what I'm talking about. He was very rich and became terribly sad. It was not just sad. <laughs> that sadness was qualified. He became terribly sad. Why? He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let them go. So why would Jesus answer a question about eternal life with giving? Why? Are you going to buy your salvation? No. Absolutely not. Salvation has been freely given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it cost him everything, but we got it for free. Thank God for that. So you are not going to buy your salvation. Forget that. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Amen? And God is certainly not trying to raise cash. He's not into fundraising. No, but I can tell you this morning, 
that if you and I are going to walk in the God's life and fulfill God's dream, then God is going to have to raise us. He's not trying to raise money, but he's trying to raise people. And one of the ways in which God raises people is teaching us and challenging us in the area of our giving. Now, notice what happened to this man. When Jesus told him about giving, the Bible said he was terribly sad. And the truth of the matter is, that's the same thing that happened with most people when you start talking about this. But I'm not going to let that deter me this morning because I'm on my way somewhere. Because I have a vested interest in making sure that you guys live the God's dream, the God's plan, and become fulfilled and be, get to a place of abundance, a place of fulfillment, and a place of satisfaction. Now, just right off the bat, let me just cut through the chase. The reason Jesus did this is because, now hear this, hear this very well, given is the only expression of a love for God. Okay. Do, re, mi, la, ti, do. I'm going to say that again. Giving is the only expression of our love for God. Love, L-O-V-E, for God and for your family and for the body of Christ and for the world. There is only one thing to demonstrate God's love. Give it. Ah, I got your attention. For God so loved the world Oh, he loved the world, he gave it someone. He loved the world, he opened a blind eye. He loved the world, he came to your house and ate dinner. No. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So don't let's talk about love if we don't talk about giving. Giving is the only expression of God's love. Now, when I say given, let me now define given. Given of your time, you give your time to God, to your family, to the body of Christ, and to the world because you love them. Given of your talent, your skills, your abilities, your anointings, you give it to God, to your family, to the body of Christ, and to the world. Ha! Ah, and the last one, the one you don't want to hear, your treasures. Treasures, you give your treasures to God, to your family, to the body of Christ, and to the world. All of these as a result of your love. Now, say this with me, because I want this to get into you. Say, giving, giving. Is, the is the only expression, expression of, God's love. of God's love. Amen. If we're going to be like God, because God loves us, he gave. I just showed you that in the scripture. For God so loved the world, he gave. And what did he give? His only begotten son. He did not give uh, a man or a woman that's uh, lame, halted, or blind, or scarred. He gave his very best. Now, a second reason that this is important a second reason why this is important, and this is critical, is because on the equation of things, giving is the lowest denominator in the kingdom of God. Okay, I know that's, that's a little heavy. Let me go to a scripture on Luke chapter 16. Give me Luke chapter 16 in the... Uh, New King James translation, Luke chapter 16, verse 10, I believe it is. And later on, in weeks to come, I will unpack this passage. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. 
Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Okay. It's, it says, he who is faithful in that which is least is also faithful in much. And he who is unjust in that which is least is unjust also in much. Now, I don't have time in the context of this message to unpack that whole passage. But if you read Luke 16, verses 1 through 10, Jesus is talking about the unfaithful steward. A steward is the person who has been charged with managing the affairs of somebody else. Amen? And in this case, the context is money. This steward has been charged with managing the affairs of his boss. And the word came to the boss that the steward was mismanaging or embezzling his resources. Okay? And so Jesus used that teaching to help establish that if you and I are not faithful over that which is least, who will commit to us the true riches? Ah. Man, 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 man. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to go through, because I, I don't want to go through all Luke, Luke chapter 16. Just take it from me for right now, because I need to move on. And I'm going to come back and really unpack this. You need to see this. Of all the riches of the kingdom of God, what do I mean by riches? Spiritual gifts, healing, prosperity. Uh, you need cancer healed. You need blind eye open. Uh, you need relationship mended. Uh, of all the riches, money is the least. And let me tell you why it's the least. It's the most common of all the riches, all the blessings in the kingdom of God. Why is it the least? Why is it the most common? Because right now, this morning, everybody in this room do not need a blind eye open. Everybody in this room right now do not need to be healed of cancer. But everybody in this room will need to have an interaction with what? Money. So money cuts across the board of all the kingdom of God. Everybody does not need knee healing. You may not need favor today. You don't need relationships mended. There are so many things that are available in the kingdom of God, but all of them do not relate or speak to us all at the same time, except money. Everybody pays a mortgage or a rent. You put gas in your car. You put food on the table. You interact with money every day. Everybody does that. Do you understand what I'm saying? So God is saying, this is what God is saying. If you are going to trust me with your life, you are going to trust me with eternal life. You are going to trust me with the expectation and the hope that someday you're going to go to heaven. If you are going to trust me with that, where it starts is you have to trust me with your money now. Ah, idiot. Let me take off my jacket. Goodness. <laughs> Hallelujah. You guys, I, 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 I can imagine how Jesus looked at those Pharisees, man. You guys are looking at me very funny. I love it. Keep on looking funny. <laughs> Jesus is saying, listen, before you can trust me for a healing of cancer, trust me with money. If you are not faithful in that which is least, how can I commit to you the true riches? If you cannot believe me for $10, $20, $1,000, the day comes you need a healing for whatever the condition is and you will be able to trust. You can't. You cannot. And so as we are all anticipating that God is taking us from one place to the next, that God wants to fulfill his plan for us, his purpose for our life, we must understand that. We 
We must not be like this ruler who when Jesus told him what to do, remember? If a trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? This guy heard the, heard the sound. Sell your goods and give it to the poor. Now, who is talking to him? Jehovah El Shaddai. The almighty God who created every silver and every, dollar, every, every gold is telling him, sell your goods and give away. But because the guy had no trust in who was talking to him, had no relationship with that person, with Jesus, he was terribly sad. Not on recognizing that if he actually did what Jesus told him to do, he more than make up for everything he ever gave away. Yes. Lack of trust. And so God is saying, if you're going to trust me with every moment of your life, every day I've recorded for you, if you're going to trust me to bring those things to pass, the beginning stage is how you deal with money. <laughs> if you are unfaithful in that which is least, who will commit to you the true riches? And I'm going to deal with that at another teaching very, very well. So now, in the meantime, let's jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Are you guys still here? <laughs> Praise God. Let's go to verse 6. 2 Corinthians 9, 9, 6. So here we see Paul talking to us about the loss of sowing and reaping. He says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap what? Sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Go on. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance of every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness, righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase fruits of your righteousness. I guess we can just stop there for one minute. So don't forget how we get on this subject. We are trying to, uh, to live out the dream that God has for us. And we're saying in order to live out that dream, we have to trust God. We have to trust God. You cannot live out that dream without trusting God. There's no, there's no way to live the God kind of life apart from trusting the God who's directing the affairs. And so this morning we're saying the beginning of the trust in God is demonstrated in, how, in our interaction and how we deal with money. If God cannot get me to give $10 or $100 or $1,000, he will not be able to get me to open the eye of the blind. If I'm not going to be able to trust God with money, I will not be able to trust him with the true riches. It doesn't happen. This is the training ground if you're going to move on into bigger things of God. That's what God is saying. This is the training ground. Because this is something you do every day. Money, gasoline, food, rent, phone bill. And God is saying, listen, you are the steward, I am the owner. God owns all of it. All silver and all gold, they belong to him. Oh man, let's get to one scripture quickly and then we'll come back. First Chronicles, chapter 29. First Chronicles 29. Verse, yeah, verse, verse, oh man, there's so much of this. Verse 12. First Chronicles 29, verse 12. Oh, thank you. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand is it to make great and to give strength to all. Go ahead. 
Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Go ahead. But who I am and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? Now, hear what David says. For all things come from who? You. And of your own, we have given you. So you're not giving God anything that is not already God's. Next verse. For we are aliens and pilgrims before you, as were all our fathers, uh, this on earth as shadow. Uh, verse 14. Did we get verse 14? Okay, yeah, okay, so we got it. Amen. Give me verse 16 before we leave this passage. Verse 16. Thank you. Oh Lord our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and it's all your own. So the point here is there is nothing that's in your possession that God does not own. Settle that. God is the owner, you are the steward. Do you get that? Oh, my goodness. Okay, let's say it together because you guys, have made, you, some of you are terribly, terribly sad. <laughs> and I want to bring you out of your sadness. <laughs> say, God, uh, you, own you own everything. 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 Amen. Psalms 24 says, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. There is nothing that you and I have that God does not own. You must understand that. He is the owner. So at best, you and I are stewards. And you know what stewards do? They take instructions. Do this, they do it. Do that, they do that. And when they fail, they're fired. It's that simple. So you must understand. You need to settle that. You don't own anything. And we know that, God forbid, if you stop breathing. You find out very quickly you don't, you don't own anything. I've never seen anybody that's buried with their treasures. Except for fools. Except for some fools. They may do it. They may try to do it. So we need to resolve that. Amen? God owns everything we are stewards. And I'm saying to you, Paul said, for stewardship, every steward must give an account. Every steward must give an account. Not just with money. What do you do with your anointing? What do you do with your, with your skills? What do you do with your life, your time? Because God gave all of that to us. We didn't bring them here. He gave them to us. Amen? So we must understand what God is after here. Now, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's begin to unpack that. So Paul tells us that we must, uh, we, give, we give sparingly, we reap sparingly. We sow bountifully, we reap uh, bountifully. Amen? So we must understand, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me let me back up and say this. I mentioned just now that the law of sowing and reaping is in operation, so let me quickly take a pause. Because many of us are saying, oh, wait, with the law, aren't we under grace? How does a law come in when we are already, in fact, under grace? And you are right, we are under grace. But being under grace does not stop all the laws that are existing. Let me give an example. If I got on Brazilian Highway in my car and start driving 100 miles an hour down the street and get to the stoplight and run right through it when it's red, I can guarantee you I won't get too far. Right. Before the Gwinnett Police Authority will stop me and help me understand you live under grace, but there's a law in Gwinnett County. <laughs> Amen. So living under grace does not mean certain things are still not functioning. You go on top of a 50-story building and you say, well, I live under grace. I'm just going to jump off the 50-foot-story building and grace will catch me. No, grace will not catch you. 
grace will be mending your broken body when you hit the ground. Why? Because there's law of gravity. That's in operation. Okay? So I'm saying this to, to help you understand how the covenant of grace is, it, it exists, but there are also certain laws within the kingdom of God that's still in operation. The Bible says in Genesis, while the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest, hot and cold, winter and summer. These shall not cease. That's what the Bible says. So now we're talking about loss of sowing and reaping. He who sows sparingly, we reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully, we reap bountifully. Amen? So you're saying to me, why are we under grace? Why do I need to sow at all to get blessed? No, you're already blessed. But this law comes to, oh, oh, what's the word? What's the word? What's the best? This law of sowing and reaping does not remove the fact that you are blessed already. But what it's saying to you is, as you cooperate with the laws that God has placed in the earth, your blessings will be that much more because of that cooperation. Amen? Okay. So let me, let me, let me just hit some points. These laws are so important because they're in operation in life daily. Daily. Okay. What do I mean by that? Did anybody eat breakfast this morning? Okay. Nobody here ate breakfast. Okay. Go, go help all of you. Okay. Will anybody eat lunch today? Yes. Would you eat tomorrow? Yes. Good. As long as you eat, <laughs> anytime, okay, you are working in cooperation with the loss of sowing and reaping. Why am I saying that? How did the food on your table get there? A farmer sowed a seed. The seed that he sowed became a crop. The crop was harvested. And the harvested crop finds its way to the grocery store. You went and bought it and you're eating. So imagine if in the natural, this law is not working. How long would you be here for? Food for thought. If the laws of sowing and reaping is not working in the natural, all of our needs will not be met. What is true in the natural is true in the spirit. Just as the laws of sowing and reaping works in the natural and it sustains us, and we know that in those places where those rules, where, where that law is, 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 is uh, uh, it's not working well. Maybe there's farming and so forth and so on. We know what happens in those places. So in the same way spiritually, Paul is saying, you and I must sow, and if we sow sparingly, we reap sparingly. But if we sow bountifully, you reap bountifully, bountifully. Now, isn't it amazing that you can sow one seed just one, one grain, one corn, one cannon of corn. And the harvest is much more than the one that you sow. Isn't that amazing? Jesus told us. He said, except a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. So if you want to see the seed multiply, it must die. Die meaning it must leave you. It must be released from you. That's the only way there's going to be multiplication. Okay, let me just move on. So here we see grace in operation with love, sowing and reaping. Why do I say that? God supplies the seed freely. God supplies the soil freely. God gives the rain freely. And God gives the sunlight freely. So God's grace... It's in operation, even in the law of sowing and reaping. It supplies the seed, it gives us the soil, it supplies the rain, and it gives us sunlight freely. So now, how does grace work with the law of sowing and reaping? How does it work? How does it work? Go back to verse 10 for me, 2 Corinthians 9, 10. How does grace work? With this love, so in a repeat. 
Now, may he who supplies seed to the sower. So number one thing you need to know here is, if there's anyone who at any time wants to participate in this law of sowing and reaping, he said, God, I want to give. I want to be a blessing. The first thing you must know is God gives the seed. God gives the seed. There is no one that will say they have a yearning in their heart to be a blessing to give for which God will not put seed in your hand. For most of us, we already have seed. Why? You have a job. God allow your job to pay you so you have seed. But for those of us who may be unemployed, and you say, you know what? I still want to be a blessing. I want to give. I don't want to miss the opportunity to be to sow. The Bible says, may he who supplies seed to the sower, God will make sure seed gets into your hand. I can guarantee you that. If you ever want to be a blessing to anyone, I say, oh God, I really wish I could do something about this. I guarantee you, your heart is open and your ears are open. The Holy Spirit will speak something, lead you somewhere. Seed will place in your hand so you can do what your heart is yearning to do. Amen? Let's move on. Let's move on. Now, once you get seed in your hand, you have a decision to make. Verse 7. Give me verse 7. Verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So now I have seed. I have a job, I get paid, or I, didn't have, I don't have a job, God's placed seed in my hand. Now it's decision time. It's decision time. Because the Bible says, let each one give as he purposes in his heart. In other words, now you have a choice. You have a decision to make. Don't give grudgingly of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So to, number one, God gives us the seed. Number two, now I have the seed. What do I do with it? Now, this is where most people really blow it. This is where we blow it. We have the seed. And we're wondering, okay, should I give? Should I not give? If I give, how much should I give? What should I do? Blah, 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 blah. Forgetting the fact that the Holy Spirit is there to help you. The Holy Spirit is there to help you. People are fighting over, is tired enough for today, is tired enough for today. I won't get, there now, get to that now. Maybe in the later, later, later teachings to come. If you are hearing from God, that should not even be a question. That should not be a question. Because for as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You should not be struggling over those uh, issues or questions when you have an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit and you are hearing from him. So it supplies seed to the sower and then once you get the seed, now you have to make a decision. Many of us, number three point, many of us, we hesitate at making this decision out of fear and unbelief. You are scared to death that if I gave this last $10, I'll be stranded. If I gave this $100, if I gave this $1,000, fear and unbelief. You're saying, oh, my mortgage is due by the end of the month. I've got to sit on this money now. The good news is it's not end of the month yet. It's not end of the month. Why are you, why are you, why are you worried about end of the month? End of the month is 23 days away. And you're packed here worrying about something that's going to happen 23 days later. And you say, you trust God? Do you see the inconsistency? No. Man, I'm, I'm praying. Listen, the, from the look of your faces, I'm going to be on this for a long time. <laughs> Let me just give you the notice now. We're going to be on this for a long time. Why? Because I want us to get to that point where when you hear giving or money... You are rejoicing because you are set free. Many of us are in bondage. Yeah. Because you are trusting your income, your paycheck. You are trusting 
your, your ability to make money from week to week to week to week. It is wrong. I told those around me, I don't ever want to get in the place where I become so complacent with God where I can predict next year, 10 years. No, I don't want to get to that place. I want to live on the edge. <laughs> Why? It is adventurous. Living the way you are living, that's why so many of us are so boring. Boring, you can't have friends. You are boring. Why? Because, because there's nothing new in your life. You go to work on Monday, you come back on Friday, get a paycheck. Get a, I mean, your life is predictable, it's boring. And not only that, the fear is, if we don't get on with God, we will never have anything to transfer to our children when it comes to faith adventures. Because they've never seen us believe God and see God's breakthrough. Never. They've seen us believe IBM. They've seen us believe General, General Motors, General Electric, but not God. And you think you're going to transfer God to them by you believing on General Motors? It doesn't happen that way. I want to be on the edge. God, if you don't deliver me, it's over. I love it. I love it. I love it. And the truth is, God is faithful. How would you ever be able to say he's faithful? How? How? If you're always predictable. Amen? So it's surprising to the sower. Then you have to make a decision. Most do not make a decision to trust God because they are fearful and they are in unbelief. They are just fearful. They are afraid. If I give, then this will happen. If I give, then I can't pay my card note. I can't pay my house note. I can't do this. I can't, I can't do that. Fear. We know a lot of people, and I'm going to deal with that in another teaching by itself. Amen? And then the next question is, how do you sow? You can sow out of necessity. You can sow out of grudge. Or you can sow cheerfully. Galatians chapter 6, verse, verses 7 through 9. Galatians chapter 6, uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, 7 through 9. It says, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that we also reap. Verse 8 says, for he who sows to the flesh, we reap of the flesh corruption. But he who sows to the spirit, we of the spirit reap everlasting life. So how do I sow to the flesh? I sow the, to the flesh when I give grudgingly or out of necessity. Grudgingly is, or necessity is, ah, here, here to go again. Ah, they're talking about money. Hey! That's grudging now. Let me stop this man from just talking about money. Let me just, okay, I've given the offering. Now shut up. You give grudgingly when the, your heart is not aligned with God and you're just giving out of obligation. Folks, we should never give out of obligation. We should give because we want to. And that's what I'm believing the Holy Spirit to help you and I to get to. So in other words, I don't have to give, but I want to give. Did you understand the difference? Say that with me. I don't have to give, but I want to give. Huge. Do you catch the difference there? I don't have to give. Old Testament says you must give. You don't give, you are cursed. Grace says, because of what you've done for me, I am not giving because of an obligation. I'm giving out of gratitude. I want to give because you have given so freely to me. 
Jesus in Matthew chapter 10 says, freely you've received, freely give. If you've not received freely, then maybe you have a point to say, you know what, I cannot give freely. So we are not talking here about having to give, we are talking about wanting to give. And that can only happen through the work of the Holy Spirit. Because as human beings, we are all very selfish and self-centered. And God is trying to teach us and win us and help us to understand that if we're going to trust him for the bigger things, it begins with you trusting him where money is concerned, with the little things. Money is little to God. Little to God. Amen? So, I give in my flesh when I give out of necessity and when I give grudgingly. But in other words, when I give with a bad attitude. That's the translation. Grudgingly, of necessity, you are giving with a bad attitude. You are sowing to the flesh, and that reaps corruption. But Paul says in that verse uh, um, 8, he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap, reap everlasting life. How do I sow to the spirit? By giving cheerfully. By giving cheerfully. Amen? Now, let me go back to, let me just close that by going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 for a minute. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Giving cheerfully, not that I have to, but I want to. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Amen? So when you sow cheerfully, the Bible says that God multiplies the seed you've sown. He multiplies the seed that you've sown. Now go back to verse 8. Oh, he multiplies the seed you've sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now I, I, I better address that. Increasing the fruits of your righteousness does not mean that you earn your righteousness. Your righteousness is a gift. When you became born again, you received a gift of righteousness. But through your giving, the apostle is telling us here that through our giving, God multiplies and increases our fruits of fruit of righteousness. What does that mean? The fruit of righteousness is, 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 is referring to the result of your righteousness or the reward of righteousness, not righteousness itself. You are righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. You cannot earn that. You can't buy that. You cannot sow for that. But however, as a result of your having been righteous, when you now sow and give, God is saying the fruit of your righteousness Righteousness will increase. What is the fruit of righteousness? Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, long suffering. In other words, the manifestation of the righteous life in you will increase. Are there any takers this morning? Are there anybody here this morning that want to say, I want to see the increase of God's righteousness in my life, the manifestation? Are there anybody? No, you guys are not involved. You guys don't want any of that. Oh, you're still looking for Cadillacs and Lexus from. from Nobody's excited about righteousness. What would our world look like if love is manifested every day? What would our world look like when you walk to your office tomorrow morning and they see love in this, on display? They see gentleness on display. They see goodness on display. They see meekness on display. They see long suffering on display. What would our world look like? It's not just about money, folks. Fools have money. But the fruits of righteousness is what is going to change our world. That's what's going to get the world's attention. Because they have money, they don't have the fruits of righteousness. You don't have to be born again to have money. But you have to be born again to display the fruits of righteousness. And God says when you give, Cheerfully, not only will it multiply the seed you sow in, but will also increase in your life the fruits of righteousness. 
One last verse and we close. Verse 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. Thank you. And God is able to make what? All grace. All. All grace abound in, uh, abound towards you that you always having what? All sufficiency in all things. Look at the emphasis on all in that verse. Look at the emphasis on all. And all of this as a result of your giving. It's able to make all grace. Grace for healing. Grace for promotion. Grace for favor. Grace for relationship mending. Grace for progress. All grace. Because remember, the grace of giving is the common denominator. And once you begin to partake and begin to plug in the grace of giving, God says, this grace of giving opens the door to all the other graces you are looking for. Makes all grace available. All grace. Say all grace. The way to tap into all grace is through the grace of giving. You are looking at it. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you always have what? All sufficiency. Whatever the situation calls for, you are sufficient. All sufficiency. In all things. You may have an abundance for every good work. That's where we're going, folks. And I'm saying to you in this opening message, the way to tap into this is to get into the grace of giving. Get into the grace of giving. Now, again, this message is not complete, but I'm just beginning to introduce it because I want us to get to that place where we are all satisfied, fulfilled, enjoying the full blessings that God has for us. But it starts when we trust him. And God is saying, I know you trust me when you're able to trust me with your finance. That's when I know you trust me. Forget the lip service. If I was to ask the question this morning, how many people here trust God? Everybody would say they trust God. God said, I already know. I took the poll. I know you will all say you trust me, but the way I really know you trust me, are you willing to part with your purse? That's where the rubber meets the road. And for many of us, I don't think we are at that point. But I'm praying that God will help us to where we have a repentant heart, a change of mind to get to the place where we totally, completely are at rest with God driving our finance. Amen? Amen. And so, Father, we thank you for this time. We bless your name that we are trusting you. Not just with our lips, but we are going to be able to get to that point, God, where we are trusting you with the grace of giving. And that because of our giving, not only would you multiply seeds sown back into us, but we have an increase of the fruits of righteousness manifesting in our lives so that we can become indeed your world changers. That everywhere we go, men and women will acknowledge the fruit of righteousness that is in our lives. Lord, I know that many of us may have issues of fear and perhaps even unbelief for which we cannot trust you. We are afraid. And so this morning, I banish every spirit of fear. I cancel out every intimidating free spirit that causes you to be afraid. And I pray that you will get to the place where you can unleash your faith in God and trust him and take him at his word. And I in doing so, you begin to see the abundance that God can bring into your life and get you to the place of fulfillment and satisfaction. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.